Pray that your happiness and joy nobody will take from you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. We bless your name for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us together for a retreat, a time of refreshing, a time of edification, a time of transformation, and a time when we're renewed in your presence. We're asking, Lord, that this time will advance in the kingdom in Jesus' name. And Lord will transcend everywhere, everything we have been in the past in Jesus' name. Teach us your word. Write your word upon the table of every heart in Jesus' name. Here in our Alpha location, Port Harcourt, all over in every region, all over in every state in our country, all over in every nation in Africa and beyond Africa. Lord, we pray that today you reveal yourself in a new dimension to everyone in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that your word will remain fresh in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me good, good, amen. God bless you. You can sit down. I want to remind you once again that this is retreat. A retreat time is a time we come together, abandon every other thing, and we concentrate on the word of God, the bread of life, and the water of life. So that our, for the retreat, our lives will be renewed, regenerated, turned around. If for the retreat, it comes to enlighten us and to educate us. And we as students of the world, and we as recipients of the grace of God, we take in everything, we allow the world to enter and to penetrate our lives and teach. it is to transform our lives if you attend a retreat and your life remains the same dull weak without strength and without spiritual power no transformation you have not really attended retreat retreat time is for your life to be transformed and then art is to refresh you you're feeling dry you're feeling cold, you're feeling lukewarm, and then retreat time has come. And then your life is refreshed, and then you say, enough, there is something I didn't know before. I didn't know that verse before, but now that verse is very new to me. I am enlightened. Retreat time is to enlighten us. What's the mind of God? What's the will of God? What does he want for my life and for my present and my future? Retreat time is to advance. Advance in my knowledge. Advance in the will of God. Advance in my obedience to the Lord. Advance and go beyond where I was before. Retreat time is to make me transcend and transcend and go beyond everywhere I'd ever been. You come to the retreat, make up your mind that during the retreat, all the time, you'll not be roaming about the compound. You sit down and you receive. You're edified, you're educated, and then your life will never be the same again in Jesus' name. We're following a series in our retreat talking about Christ. In the evening, we're talking about Christ, the Passover. Christ, our peace. Christ, our power. And Christ, our pattern. In the morning session, we're talking about Christ. Christ, we crucified with Christ. Christ, we're dead and buried with Christ. Christ, we're risen with Christ. And then Christ, we're conquering with Christ. I pray all the revelation that will come 
concerning Christ will be impactful in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. This morning, we're talking about crucified with Christ. And I'm reading from Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When it says we're crucified with Christ, Romans chapter 6 tells us the same thing. Romans chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 6. It says, knowing this. We need to know this not only in the head. We need to know this not only by reading. We need to know this by experience that it happened to you. That a time came in your life when you heard about the crucifixion of Christ and then you wanted to know experientially. You wanted to have the experience knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Look at verse 12. It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body after you are crucified by Christ, knowing why Christ was crucified. How Christ was crucified, and for who Christ was crucified, knowing that you stand at the gate of your heart. And when sin knocks at the door, there's no room for you here. Let not sin of any size, of any shape, of any description, Coming from anywhere, the common sin, the habitual sin, the peculiar sin, society sin, the first century or this century sin, any kind of sin. Let not sin. You will make up your mind as a converted person. A crucified person, a yielded person to the Lord, a person that is holy, completely consecrated. Consecrated and committed unto the Lord. Converted, crucified, consecrated, that you stand at the gate of your heart and any sin of any shape coming from any direction the one you've done before and the way you have lived before let not sin therefore the therefore is because you know Christ because you love Christ and because you have come so come in contact with Christ that you are crucified with him. Therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Then in verse 13, it says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, which means it's in your hand. It's by your volition. You can if you want. You will not if you don't want. Because now it says you will not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves. It's in your hand. You can and nobody can force you anymore. Bend this way, bend that way. You stand straight as somebody who has met Christ, converted by Christ, 
leaning on Christ, depending on the grace of Christ, and now you are able to yield your members, yourself, your totality, your personality unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness unto God. It is possible it will be done. In your life, it will be done. Every day, it will be accomplished in your life in Jesus' name. Neither therefore yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members, your mouth, your hand, your ears, your heart, every part of you, the decision-making part of your life, <clears throat> that you yield all those members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I pray with the grace of God, with the presence of God, with the power of God in your life, every day, all through your life, this victorious life will be yours in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the crucifixion of the sinless Savior. The crucifixion of the sinless Savior. Without sin, without evil, without the Adamic nature, without depravity, without any known sin, Christ still was crucified. Why? He did that for us. Number one, the crucifixion of the sinless Savior. Number two, our crucifixion with the sacrificial substitute. He was our substitute. He died the death we should have died. He bore the punishment we should have borne. He went all the way and he paid the price. It was our substitute. Substitute in the sense that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. He did not sin, we sinned. And because of our sin, a substitute died for us. He was crucified with us. And knowing that he was crucified with us, we stay by his side. We come to his side and we're crucified with him. Our crucifixion was the sacrificial substitute. Number three, the crucifixion unto the sinful society. That society is the world, is the community, is the tribe, is the environment in which we live. And that world wanting to press us to its mold, we then say that cannot be because now we're crucified with Christ and we are crucified unto the world and the world is crucified unto us and because of that the world does not have authority or dominion over us because now we have come into a new realm and we are crucified to the world and the world is crucified unto us the crucifixion unto the sinful society. Let's look at number one. Number one, the crucifixion of the sinless Savior. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. 
ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. He was definitely crucified. And they were told in chapter 4 of Acts, verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, he was crucified, and whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man, the healed man, the man that had perfect soundness, does this man stand here before you hold? And then in verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Now verse 12, the conclusion, neither is there salvation in any other, only in the crucified one, Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. In any generation, in that generation, or in this generation, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The crucifixion of the sinless Savior. Three things. Number one, the prophecy of his crucifixion. Number two, the perfection of the crucified. Number three, the purpose of his crucifixion. Number one, the prophecy of his crucifixion. The crucifixion of Christ did not come as a shock to heaven. The crucifixion of Christ did not come as a surprise to Christ himself. The crucifixion of Christ was not something like an afterthought. It was something already known to heaven. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, enmity between you and the woman, and between the seed and her seed. He'll bruise your head, although you'll bruise his heels. That's the prophecy, the first prophecy revealed to Adam and Eve concerning the crucifixion. Then in Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's looking way far to the time of the crucifixion. Why art thou so far? From helping me and from the words of my roaring. Look at verse 16 there. In verse 16 it says, For those have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Look at this, look at this. They pierce my hands and my feet. That's the crucifixion right there. It's been prophesied thousands of years before Christ came. And when Christ was coming, he knew he was coming to be your substitute, my substitute, our substitute. He was going to die on the cross of Calvary by no other death. That is the reason why all throughout the lifetime of Jesus, he tried to push him over the cliff that he would die. Just walked across. And there was no harm because he knew that the prophecy must be fulfilled. And any time they said, Are you going there? Are you going there? Because the Jews are looking for you, he'll say, My time is not yet. He knew 
that the prophecy must be fulfilled. Everything that is written concerning the Son of Man must be fulfilled. They pierced my hands and my feet. Look at verse 17 there. It says, I may tell all my bulls. They look and stare upon me. Look at verse 18. They part my garments. Among them, they cast lots upon my, vest, my vesture. The prophecy of his crucifixion. Look at Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced he had not even come to the world at that time and yet the prophecy had been written they look upon him whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for his firstborn. Let's now come to number two. Number two is the perfection of the crucified. Did he do something wrong? Probably in secret. Probably little thing. Probably against one man. Against a family. Against a tribe. Against the whole nation. Nothing like that. Perfect. In heart. In thought. In life. In work. In everything. Christ. Perfect. And yet... The perfect one was crucified. Why? The perfect was crucified for the imperfect. The just was crucified for the unjust. The sinful was crucified. The sinless was crucified for the sinful. And the one that knew no sin was crucified for the people that lived all their lives in sin. The perfection of the crucified. Look at John chapter 19 verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and says unto them, Behold, I bring him forth unto you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. No, that I find no fault in him. They examined him as they will examine somebody accused. I find no fault. They examined him as they will examine a criminal. I find no fault in him. They examined him as somebody that did something against the government, against the nation. I find no fault in him. They dribbled him here and there, asked all their questions, even with torture. And yet, I find no fault in him. Perfect. Look at verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate says unto them, Behold the man, the sinless man, the holy man, the righteous man, the good man who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Behold the man, the heavenly man, the redeeming man, the one that came, the perfect man, to take away our sins. Behold the man. Then in verse 6, it says, 
when the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him they cried out saying crucify him crucify him Pilate says unto them take ye him and crucify him for I as for myself I find no fault in him look at second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 perfect savior perfect substitute perfect sacrifice the perfect one in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 for he has made him god he has made him christ to be seen sin offering for us who knew no sin who knew no sin who had no sin who committed no sin that we might be made that the purpose that we sinful men and women we the sons and daughters of adam we the one born in sin conceived in sin and practicing sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him that the purpose the perfect was crucified for the imperfect that's the purpose the righteous was crucified for the unrighteous that's the purpose the good man was crucified for the bad people that's the purpose that christ sinless holy and righteous was crucified for sinners that we might be made the righteousness of God in him look at Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 Hebrews 7 verse 25 therefore he is able therefore perfect holy righteous a substitute for everyone and he has done all that God requires therefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth the perfect one ever liveth the sinless one ever liveth to make intercession for them look at verse 26 it says for such an high priest became us befitted us who is holy harmless defiled separate from sinners made higher than the heavens first john chapter 3 verse 5 in first john chapter 3 verse 5 and ye know that he christ was manifested to take away our sins look at this and in him is no sin and in him is no sin perfect savior perfect sacrifice perfect substitute we're going to number three here now in number three we have the purpose of his crucifixion but why will a righteous man be crucified perfect man be crucified the sinless son of god be crucified there's a purpose for that that's what we look at here the purpose of his crucifixion in isaiah chapter 53 we're looking at verse 4 surely he has borne our griefs for us he did it he carried our souls for us <clears throat> he did it yet we did esteem him striking smitten of god and afflicted the smiting that should have come upon you came upon him and the striking that should come upon you came 
upon him. The affliction, the punishment, the judgment that should have come upon you came upon him. Look at verse 5. But he was wounded for transgressions. That's the purpose. It was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, tell me out aloud, we're here. That's the purpose. That's the reason why he took everything away. Sin and the consequence of sin. Sin and sickness. Sin and sorrow. Sin and suffering. Sin and eternal punishment. He took everything away by his crucifixion. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. As you look at that verse, the first word, all. The last word, all. And then in the middle, everyone. Everyone. All of us, you and I. And nobody is more important than you, than him, than her, everyone. He did this for everyone. And so we can come to him when you are weighed down by your guilt, by your condemnation. When you are weighed down by the things you have done. Then you remember as you look up. All at the beginning, all at the end, everyone in the middle. Look at this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. The Lord has laid on him. The Lord, the Almighty God, knowing that if you died in sin, you'll bear the punishment for all eternity. That will be too much. And because of his love, he said, Let my sinless, perfect, holy, righteous son go and be your substitute. And it says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I pray. The reality will dawn on you. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're looking at verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Reading from verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's what he did. That the purpose, he died not for himself. He died for our sins, not only for Israel, for the Gentiles. Because Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Because he was writing to the Corinthians, they were not Israelites. He died for everyone. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who gave himself for us. You see that? That's the purpose. That's the purpose. He suffered already, he shouldn't suffer. He bore the punishment already, he shouldn't bear the punishment. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. There are some people that have struggled on their own and they have tried and they have not succeeded. And so they say nobody can be free from all sins because of their own experience. Number one, they are making themselves the standard for the millions and billions of people in the world. And they say nobody, nobody can be free from all sins because they little self they are not free from all sin they say nobody can be free and then that makes the sacrifice of christ cheap and you didn't depend on christ you are depending upon yourself he gave himself for us 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now was in the end of the world, as he appeared to put away, put away, put away by sin, by the sacrifice of himself. By the sacrifice of himself, he has now put away all sin. And I pray the effect of his crucifixion will be in your life in Jesus' name. In my life, in Jesus' name. In my life, in Jesus' name. Confirmed in Jesus' name. Let's come to number two now. Number two, our crucifixion with the sacrificial substitute. Our crucifixion with the sacrificial substitute. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, and you can know that anytime it actually gets into your heart, then you wake up and you say, that's for me. He did that for me. And the Lord will give you the experience knowing Knowing this, that our old man, the old man we inherited from Adam and Eve, the old man in his old ways, old life, old lifestyle, old behavior, old habit, old indulgence, that the old, our old man is crucified with him. Even ordinarily, you know that anyone that is crucified, hands nailed, feet nailed, becomes inoperative. He cannot operate anymore. He cannot act anymore. As long as he's nailed to the cross, he cannot jump down and then go on the highway and be doing what he was doing before. The old man crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, not subdued, destroyed, not controlled, destroyed, not resisted, destroyed, and it is not civilized destroyed that the old man being crucified now the body of sin might be destroyed that is forth we shall not serve sin look at galatians chapter 2 verse 20 i am crucified with christ if he had said I was crucified with Christ. That will imply I was, but I came out of it. I regaled out of it. I'm no more crucified now. But he said, yes, I was when I knew Christ. Until now, every day, I still experience that. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. That is, I live. The new man lives. The new personality lives. Not I, not the old man, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, three things. Number one, the proving conversion from the fleshly life. 
the proven conversion from the fleshly life. Number two is the present crucifixion of the former life. The present crucifixion that as you have experienced the crucifixion in the past, now the present life, that crucifixion is still effective. The present crucifixion of the former of the former life. Number three, perpetual consecration to the faith life. The perpetual consecration to the faith life. Let's start from number one there. Number one there is the proving conversion. The proving conversion from the fleshly life. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Let me start from verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. What does that mean? They that are Christ, they who belong to Christ, they who have given their lives unreservedly, uninterruptedly, they have given their lives unto Christ. What have they done? They have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. Of course, you understand that does not mean after conversion, then you went somewhere and then you stretch your hand and your legs so that you can be crucified. Crucify the flesh. What it means, look at verse 19 now. In verse 19, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, crucify the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, that's what it means by crucifying the flesh. Fornication, crucified. Uncleanness, crucified. Lasciviousness, crucified. Verse 20, idolatry, crucified. Witchcraft, crucified. Hatred, crucified. And all the relatives of hatred. Because hatred does not stand alone. Hostility. Anger. All those things. Violence. All those things. Evil thought. Evil plan against your brother, your sister, your neighbor. All those things crucify variance. Emulations. Wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, all those things crucified. Then in verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, night parties, afternoon parties, a little thing, party. Another little thing, party. Another little thing, party. The world crucified. And then it says, and such like. If you are born again, and such like. You don't need anybody to police you and to be running after you. Why this? Why this? Why this? They are all crucified. If you are in Christ. And then it says, of the which I tell you before, 
as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. In Romans chapter 8, verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not of the flesh to live after the flesh. Verse 13, brethren, verse 13, for if ye, brethren, live after the flesh, ye shall die. After you proclaim, I'm saved, I'm justified, I'm born again, I'm forgiven, I'm a child of God, if with that profession, if with that testimony, you see, live after the flesh, you'll die like a sinner and perish like a sinner. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, kill, destroy the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Mortify, destroy, put out of the way, out of your life. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Verse 7, in the which ye also walked past tense, sometime past, sometime, when ye lived past tense in them. Verse 8, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, When you become a Christian, when the grace of God penetrates your life, when the goodness of God from Calvary enters your life, there's a new life. The old is crucified. The old is taken away. But now you put off all this in your family, your workplace, in the market, in a community, anywhere and everywhere you find yourself. They made me angry. No, they cannot make, nobody can make you angry. You got angry by yourself. They pushed me into anger. You know, I was going gently and gently because now I'm born again. And that man, that woman pushed me into anger. Nobody can push you into anything. You are in control because now Christ lives in you. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if you couldn't do it, the Lord will not tell you to do it. If you couldn't put it off, the Lord will not say, put it off. And so you cannot be having, a, you know, fighting at home, getting angry at your wife, getting angry at your husband, getting angry at everybody for every little thing or even for big things and say, what could I do? She pushed me to it. If you are born again, but now you also put up all this anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy. Can you say somebody push you into blasphemy? How can? How can? And feel, feel the communication out of your mouth. A new life. 
a new disposition, a new behavior that nobody will be in control. Anybody ca that can push you into sin has control to take you to hell. You will not give your life to anybody to draw you, drive you, pull you into hell in Jesus' name. Somebody from Patakot will say amen. Look at First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside, you have to lay it aside yourself. You are, you are converted. You are born again. You are a child of God. The power has been given to you to lay aside all malice. Look at that word all. All malice. Diplomatic malice. Private malice. Scientific malice. And normal malice. Tribal malice. And inherited malice. All of them. When you are born again. When you become a child of God, the grace of God is now in your life. Therefore, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies with all evil speakings. Then in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. That he may grow thereby. Verse 3, it says, If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Look at verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against. Your soul. Look at number two here. Number two here. The present crucifixion of the former life. Look at your life. How were you living before you were born again? Before you came to the Lord? Your feeling, your thoughts, your practice, your lifestyle, the way you went. And the things that jolted you, what were they? The former life. Now, as children of God, there's a present crucifixion of the former life. We're looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 6 again. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. We should not serve sin. Do you remember the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ? Ye cannot serve two masters. If you are serving sin, you cannot serve the Lord Jesus, our Savior. If you are serving sin, you cannot serve heaven, serve God, serve the Lord. You might hold the position that was serving the Lord, but that just word of mouth. You cannot serve two masters. If you are going to serve the Lord, then the service of sin must stop. Have you noticed when you stop serving, servicing the car, and you just abandon it? Don't just don't service it. Just leave it like that. This one will go down. That one will go down. Eventually, everything will go down. And if you stop servicing sin. And giving foil to sin. And giving encouragement to sin. And practicing sin. And you say, no more. Because now I am crucified with Christ. Henceforth, 
I will not serve sin. That sin will die out of your life. Amen. 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 Look at verse 11. In verse 11, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in verse 12, in verse 12, let not sin, don't allow it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that he should obey it and the loss thereof. Verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments unto righteousness, unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. First Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. He said, when we had the former lusts, we were ignorant now. After reading the Bible, studying the Bible, we're no more ignorant now. After knowing Christ, after being at Calvary, after being crucified with Christ, we're no more ignorant now. After knowing that without holiness, no man shall save the Lord, we're no more ignorant. All we did in the past, it was when we were ignorant of Christ of his salvation and of the fullness of redemption now as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance but 15 but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation verse 16 because it is reaching be ye holy for i am holy as long as i'm holy be ye holy as the days go by and i remain holy be ye holy at every crossroad every challenge in your life whatever is thrown at you you look up and say god i know you are still holy and i see is holy as long as he is holy whatever may be happening around you because it is reaching be ye holy for i am holy the lord perform it in your life perfect it in your life and make it ever present in your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18. For as much as he know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. It says that he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, to try to attach itself to you. I'm with you, always with you. I've been with you since birth. 
Are you going to deny me and disown me now? It says, put it all. Concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws. Then in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, that ye put on the new man. You put off the other, you must put on this one. The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Then verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Verse 28. In verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Then in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, converted to Christ, converted by Christ, crucified with Christ, if any man be in Christ up to date, at this present time, an up-to-date experience in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, tell me, tell me, tell me, check up your life, all things, check up your life, all things, check up your life in the market, at home, in the office, check up your life at school, check up your life in the college, check up your life in your community, check up your life when you go back to the village, check up your life anywhere you are. Do you have the testimony that behold, old things are passed away? Old friends, old fellowship, old gang, old behavior, old boyfriend, old girlfriend, old drinking, old smoking, old habit, old lifestyle. Old things have passed away. Even the look on your face. Somebody says, you hey, brother, why are you always wearing an angry look? Nobody has offended you. Wake up in the morning, you are angry. What's the matter? All things have passed away. Sister, what's the matter? It looks like you're always struggling and you're always in battle, fighting with somebody. What's the matter? If we're in Christ, since we're in Christ, because we're in Christ, old things are passed away. And behold, tell me once again. <laughs> tell me with assurance. All things have become new. Amen. In every one of our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and look at number three here. Number three, the perpetual consecration to the faith life. Perpetual consecration to the faith life. Look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. I rejoice in that. I delight in that. I love that. And I want to remain that way. I 
am crucified with Christ. Look at Paul, who was Saul. He used to go about with hatred and malice against the people who are following the way of Christ. But now life has turned around. A new change has come. What I loved before, I don't love those bad things anymore. Where I went before, I don't go there anymore. And the things I used to do, I don't do that anymore. I delight in the new life. I love the new life. I cherish the new life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. The old self, no, that one didn't have power. That one didn't have authority. That one didn't have any delight in holiness and righteousness. That one is gone. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth. Liveth. Leave it in me. And then it says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It will be real in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Many people walk by sight. Somebody does something, they see that, they walk by that. Somebody shows them hatred, they see that, they walk like that. Somebody took money away from them and did not return the money. That's what they see, they walk by that. They walk by sight. But the people who are walking by faith, they say, you may do that. I don't walk by that. I walk by faith. They might malign, they might malign you and slander you. I hear, I don't walk by that. I walk by faith. The world may live like they want to live. I see that. I don't walk by what I see. I walk by faith. I pray you'll walk by faith. Look at verse 15, in verse 15, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love. And walk in love. That's a personal choice. And walk in love. That is a personal decision now. If you wait for people around you to manifest, practice, perfect, perform the love that Christ wants, to walk, wants you to walk in, you wait too long. But you have to take your life in your own hand, your decision by yourself, and say, because I am crucified with Christ. No matter what others do, how others live, I choose to follow Christ, to walk in love, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us. As Christ also has loved us. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And then in First John chapter 2, reading from verse 4, he that says, I know him, and keep it not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not 
in him. Verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily, and the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. How do we know that we are in him? We are walking by faith. We are walking in love. Hereby we know that we are in him. It's not that I've been in Christianity for since a long time. That doesn't cut it. I know the Bible from cover to cover. That doesn't make it either. But that we're walking by faith. We're walking in love. Love towards God. Love for his word. And love for everyone around us. It is that that makes us to know that we're in him crucified with Christ and living by faith and living by love in him. Look at verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. The grace is available. May the grace be for every one of us in Jesus' name. For me. for me. I said for me. for me. So I will not just be a preacher. I'll preach. I'll practice. So you'll not just be a preacher. A hearer. You'll preach. You'll hear. You'll practice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Point number three now. The crucifixion. Unto the sinful society unto the world. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. God forbid that I should boast, should glory, should brag, that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's your glory? Money? Wealth? Riches? Business? The things of the world, many houses over here, over there, a house here, a house in the other place, a house in the other place. What's your glory? Education, certificate, head knowledge. What's your glory? The possession you have. What's your glory? It says, God forbid that I should glory, save, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. When the world is crucified unto you, you don't love that world anymore. Worldliness in any form, in any shape, and I crucified unto the world. Three things here. Number one, the corruption and condemnation of the world. Number two, the command and call out of the world. Number three, true crucifixion and cleansing from worldliness. Number one, the corruption and the condemnation of the world. John 3.19 this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Anyone who hates the light, anyone who despises the light of the word of God, Anyone who rejects 
who jettisons the light of the word of God is not interested in that because it's not converted really and truly. His deeds are evil. Anyone who is afraid of the light, anyone who trembles when the light comes on, is because there is something to hide and he doesn't want the light to come in. And that's the world. That's the world. That is the world. When an investigator comes, when an auditor comes into a particular place, the people that have something to hide, they tremble. And if you are like that, when somebody comes who is able to see through all the cracks and all the critical behavior, then you are afraid. It means your conversion is called into question. Because there's still corruption there, there's condemnation there. It says in verse 20, look at verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil, he tests the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's the way of the world. And if we're like that, we're corrupt like the world, we're condemned of the world. But I pray all the corruption of the world, everything will be swept away by the crucifixion of Christ in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm looking at verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Looking at verse 4. It says, In whom the God of this world. Satan is the God of this world. And all the world, they follow after him. And if you are like the world, in the world, for the world, and you are living like the world is living, then the devil will be the God of your life, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. James chapter 4, we're looking at verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers, spiritual adulterers, and adulteresses, spiritual adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world, you want to please the world in your marriage? your wedding in the reception you want to please the world in the kind of car you use you're competing the world with the world in everything the equipage that will bring to your house and then when you want to do burial ceremony that's how they do it in the world if i don't do it like this the world will know, not know that I'm somebody. I've succeeded. I'm significant. Uh-huh. You adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I will not be an enemy of God. I will not be an enemy of God. Look at number two there. Number two, the command and the call out of the world. First John chapter 2 verse 15. Love not the world. That's the commandment of God. As eternal as God is eternal. That's the commandment of God that will not pass away. Heaven and earth may pass away, will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's the commandment of God. The God who says, I am God, I change now. Coming from Christ, the same yesterday, today, 
and forever. What would you do if the world were not looking at you? How will you live if the world will not either appreciate or depreciate? What will you do? How will you live your life if the world will not say, well done? Live your life as if the world is dead unto you. And you are dead unto the world. Love not the world. Now that the things that are in the world, the things that are in the world. Then it says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Up goes the love of the world, down goes the love of God. And when your whole life, activities, purpose, plan, everything you do, your ideal is for the love of the world, then the love of God has, has vanished. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world and wants to please the world in everything it does, and he's saying, if I don't do it like that, the unbelievers, my friends, will not appreciate me. They'll say, okay, so that's, that's all you can spend for that thing. The love of the Father is not in you. Verse 16, then tells us, for all that is in the world, the lost of the flesh, the lost of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Can you look at your life from morning till evening? Regular day, normal day, or special day. And look at what you do. And look at your consideration. What do you consider before you do that? Before you plan that? Before you act that? Before you perform that? What do you consider? If what you consider is, what will they say? How would they press me? How would they pump me up? You need to go back to Calvary. For all that is in the world, the lost of the flesh, the lost of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Look at verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lost thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. We we'll plan on living forever with the Lord. Amen. You plan on living forever with the world. Now, the world can deflate that balloon. You're moving on, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I am on my way to heaven. The world and the love of the world can deflate that your balloon. And then everything goes down. And when it comes to time to go up and to go and live with the Heavenly Father forever and ever, your parachute will not open. Everything is down. The love of the world has put everything. I pray that today you come back to the love of God in fullness in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at number three here. Number three is true crucifixion and cleansing from all worldliness. It tells us in John chapter 14, reading from verse 30. John chapter 14, verse 30. Hereby, I will not talk much with you. Christ said, he has said enough. He has taught enough. He has preached enough. He has revealed enough of the revelation of heaven. Disciples, you have got it all to be saved, converted, cleansed, 
consecrated, crucified, cleaving to Christ, you've got it all. Henceforth, no more talk. I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. The prince of this world, that's the devil, is going to be coming up every time. He'll come and check up whether he still has property in you, a magnet in you, by which he can draw you into the world. He wants to come and check up whether he still deposits something in you that he can use and tie a rope there and pull you down when the rapture will happen. If you can live like Christ and talk like Christ and be crucified with Christ and say no more much talk, 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 talk. After the message, talk, talk, talk. And after the, you know, ministration, talk, talk, talk. No more talk, talk. I want real crucifixion to happen in my life henceforth hereafter i will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me amen yeah. amen yeah. what is it the devil has always deposited in your life and is coming to check up okay the anger I deposited there is still there intact. I have him. The covetousness I deposited there is still there intact. I have him. The love of the world and the love of the pleasure of the flesh is still there. I can get him anytime. Why don't you come to Christ this time afresh and be crucified with the Lord so that Every sin of the devil will be cleansed away and caught away and crucified and totally taken away from your life. And then the prince of this one will come and check up. All his property is gone out of your life, out of your heart. And then when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we that are alive, we shall be caught up together with him Praise the Lord. The sin that you have pulled you down, dragged you down, held you down, everything is taken away. Yeah. The prince of this world cometh and has nothing in you. Yeah. Where is he? Where is she? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing of this world and nothing of the devil. The Lord perform that in every life in Jesus name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up, talk to the Lord in prayer. Please, my brother, be considerate. Don't disturb other people. We want to make ourselves ready to get to heaven. We want to have all that the crucifixion of Christ takes in our lives. Brother or sister, be considerate. Just prepare for heaven. Don't disturb other people. Just pray and center your own heart, your own life on Christ and say, Yes, Lord, crucified. But Christ, now I live, yet not I. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Open your mouth. Pray, talk to the Lord, and the Lord answer your prayer.